Well, hello there. You're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the evening standard columnist Aisha Hazarika and the Sun's political editor, Tom Newton Dunn. Welcome to both of you. Good evening. So, to the front pages then, let's take a look. Starting off with The Telegraph, they're reporting that the security services have foiled an alleged plot to assassinate the Prime Minister. Two men are due to appear in Westminster Magistrates Court tomorrow. Same story for the Daily Mirror. The two men who were allegedly planning a bomb attack on Downing Street were arrested in raids in London and Birmingham last week. The Times has details of a spat between the Chancellor and the Defence Secretary. Philip Hammond has been banned from using a fleet of RAF jets and helicopters until the Treasury settles its bill. The Metro says rail passengers will be bled dry because of a 3.4% rise in fares from the new year. The Financial Times suggests Rupert Murdoch's son James could become the next CEO of Disney if the company buys 21st Century Fox. The Guardian goes with Theresa May's Brexit dilemma, saying she's under pressure to secure a breakthrough in negotiations. And the Daily Express has details of a simple three-month diet which they say can reverse the effects of type 2 diabetes. Not many calories involved, so not that simple, I would suggest there. But anyway, Aisha Hazarika, Tom Newton Dunn are here. Let's start with this terror plot, the uh, revelations of which are across many of the newspapers. Uh, the allegations in the Mirror and other newspapers, including your own, which we'll get a bit later. Yeah, really, really strong story, this, obviously, breaking uh, tonight. Um, quite a few newspapers have been uh, briefed about this. Telegraph, the Mirror, my newspaper, mm. The Sun and a few others. Um, interesting timing, of course, uh, this coming out on the day that we had the... Uh, official report into what happened or even went wrong with the Manchester and London Bridge uh, bombings. Uh, but this one is a particularly nasty of a, a long series of, of horrendous plots this year. Of uh, Two suspects, uh, both of them, it is only alleged at the moment, but mm. uh, uh, alleged by MI5 and the police uh, to attack Downing Street, first with suicide vests to uh, one of them, presumably, to blow up the gate, uh, which is filled with um, armed policemen on both sides of it. I go through it quite often. Once they got through the gate, then get into the main house in uh, number 10 Downing Street and attack the Prime Minister with knives. Uh, both uh, were arrested, uh, one while carrying uh, an IED, allegedly, and both will appear in uh, Magistrates Court tomorrow morning. So, as you said, the Telegraph also leading with this, MI5 falls Islamist terror plot to kill Theresa May. Um, is there any suggestion at all that they might be putting this out there, allegations uh, as it is at the moment, to divert attention away from the Anderson report, which did lead some to be critical about particularly the Manchester Arena bombing? Is that, is that a possibility? I, I think that's a huge possibility. Um, uh, lightning doesn't strike twice like this in terms of news stories. And also, Andrew Parker, the Director General of MI5, was in Cabinet this morning to mm. give a briefing to uh, the Cabinet on an update where we got to. Out of that, we learnt today also that there have been nine different uh, attacks this year. Some have got through, some hadn't got through. Obviously, we were well aware of the ones that did get through. This was the ninth, and it only happened a couple of weeks ago, and obviously it was foiled. But MI5 would have had a very, very difficult set of front pages uh, tomorrow, these front pages, without a doubt, because there were some pretty unpleasant findings today in, in terms of the intelligence that they had on certainly the suspect or the, the um, uh, participant in the Manchester Arena suicide bombing of Beatty. Uh, they knew him, he was a suspect of interest, uh, that had uh, several different um, intelligence reports on him, and for one reason or another, and uh, there is no blame being attached to them, because quite frankly their job is incredibly hard, uh, this intelligence wasn't acted upon, the, the significance of it wasn't checked, and he got through. So of course it's going to be better for MI5 mm. to have a story say they, they fall an attempt uh, on the life of the PM on the front pages, but quite frankly, this is also the sign of the times. This was a real attack. These two people really did try to kill the Prime Minister, uh, it is alleged, yeah. uh, and it, it goes to show what an incredible task they have to try and keep us safe on an absolutely daily basis. And the Anderson report inside the newspapers, there's the Express's take on it. MI5 mm. might have stopped the Manchester bomber. Hindsight is an extraordinary thing, obviously, in, in cases like this, isn't it? But the, the key phrase from the report, on retrospect, the intelligence on Salman yeah. Abedi can be seen to be highly relevant to the attack, and that is the difficulty for the security services. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, Amber Rudd has come out and said, look, they have done a fantastic job. And ultimately, 
it was not the security services that carried out this terrible, appalling crime. It was these men, and that's what the families have said, and that is absolutely correct. Andy Burnham has gone slightly further. He's the mayor of Manchester. He has said that there are questions for the security services to answer. I think you have to have a balanced view of this. At the end of the day, a lot of these, and it does tend to be men, they are lone wolves. They tend to kind of <coughs> operate either by themselves or in very small cells. It's very, very difficult to keep track of them. And I think, as Tom said, our security intelligence services do an incredible job. And they must live in fear of one day being the person that maybe just let a wee bit of information go through. They didn't check something up. That will haunt that person. And they take their responsibilities very, very seriously. But I think the key thing is what do we learn going forward from here? Clearly, we are living in a time where the terror threat is on high alert. We all have to be vigilant. But I think you have to be looking at putting, I think, more money and resources into um, the intelligence services. Policing as well, community policing is often very effective at picking up information because all these men, particularly in Manchester, had displayed signs of behaving quite weirdly in the run-up, which their neighbours had talked about. Mm. I believe, actually, some of their neighbours and family had reported some of their behaviour in. So it's like piecing a jigsaw together, and it involves the community, it involves the police, it involves the security services. So I think that's what we've got to look at going forward. So is resourcing a question? Uh, 20,000 people on this watch list, apparently. Correct me if I'm wrong, some 4,000 security officers with MI5, two to 3,000 police officers at any time working on that. Already mm. there are more people to watch, and it takes multiple numbers of officers to watch an individual. So already the maths doesn't add up, does it? Absolutely. And, and it won't add up because to try and watch 20,000, 20 to 30,000 mm. different suspects takes a, a, an army, literally an army and of are hundreds more coming of thousands. Back from Raqqa, Mosul, Syria, uh, Iraq. Th there the are a few hundred extent. coming back, but you know, quite frankly, the problem is already here in, a, in, a, in an enormous scale. Mm. And the amount of people, how labour intensive it is to, to keep eyes on uh, a, a dangerous suspect, it's a, it's a team of 36 because you, you need four or six at a time, 24 hours a day, so you have different teams clocking on, uh, clocking off. There's no way you can do that. So comes down to prioritization, prioritization, it was easy for me to say. <laughs> uh, and that basically means the MI5 and the, and the police have to choose the top 500 mm. of those 20 to 30,000 suspects to, to watch. And therefore, it shouldn't be a surprise that the likes of Abedi, who there was only low-level intelligence on, you know, this is a guy of concern, we should look at him if we can. Whereas you may have an active plot and you may think we need to prioritize watching the guys mm. in the plot than someone like Abedi. So, uh, Obviously, resources comes into this, and the interesting thing that David Anston didn't go into today, he wrote this report, was precisely how much more resources would have allowed MI5 to increase their target surveillance, maybe take it up six, seven, eight hundred, well, and would have been caught. Like yeah, NHS, I don't you think really? I mean, you could. Well, you know, the think... NHS gets, you know, there's a good comparison. The NHS gets billions a year poured into it. The budget last week, week before, had £2.8 billion pounds but, further poured into the NHS. But you know people are going to get ill. You don't know. But also, it's well, going to get Facebook. You do know people, people are going to try and kill the Prime Minister. It's an absolute tragedy at the current modern day of age. But so it's also... What do you do with your money? The, the fact is, the government is making terrible cuts. You know, if we just look at the defence budget that's being cut at the moment. And actually, you can argue this is a new form of defence. You know, they, this is a huge part of, like, defending our country and defending our citizens. And I think you're right, the NHS... You know, you could throw a kind of an infinite amount of money at, at this and probably the NHS, and it wouldn't be enough in many ways. And I think I go back to my earlier point. Community-led intelligence is so vital in terms of helping our security services and the police because a lot of people in the community in a lot of the mosques in the family do not want their sons and their brothers and their friends mm. involved in this kind of behavior and they are often the first people to pick up the signs when mm. these boys start acting weirdly and they will want to try and stop their children or you know their friends or family or whatever their husbands getting involved in all of this stuff so i think you've got to take a kind of hard-headed approach and you have to take a sort of soft power approach as well. OK, uh, plenty of Brexit chat, front pages, as you might expect. Just when you thought you escaped Brexit for a night. <laughs> oh, never. No. Never, oh, no. never, never, never. We're moving <coughs> through discussions we heard from David Davis before. Um, there's the Metro Scotch egg on her face. Let's go straight also to uh, the... not the eye. Uh, the FT, the FT. Uh, down yeah. the bottom there. Um, Davis trips Tory alarm bells with talk of post-Brexit regulatory 
military alignment. And we all heard this from the Commons today, didn't we, and raised an eyebrow. What's the story here? So regulatory alignment is the thing. It is the buzzword, is the buzz phrase, and prepared to hear an awful lot more about it in the next uh, coming days. Is it days. the new Article 50? It's the new Article 50. It is, it is the thing. Now, here's the thing you really need to know. It doesn't really mean anything at all. Okay. And I'll, I'll get to why that's the case briefly. Regulatory alignment is the thing that Theresa May has come up with trying to solve the great big Northern Ireland border mm. issue. And she's told the Irish and the rest of the EU that if she agrees to align our regulations, there will be no need for a hard border. But the problem is the Ulster Union say, well, you can't just give us a separate solution. So she's having to agree to do it for the whole of the UK, mm. only when it pertains to issues in the Good Friday Agreement, which is small amounts of stuff like energy, agriculture, etc. although it does begin to cascade. All well and good, you say. Ah, yes, the Brexiteers say. But regulatory alignment means exactly what? Does that mean we're having to take rules from the EU for years and years more? That's what we voted for to leave, they say. And this is actually a fudge of words to get us into phase two, to get yeah. us past the divorce deal, into the, the trade talks, when, quite frankly, regulatory alignment will cease to matter. We'll all forget the phrase ever existed, because hopefully we'll get on to a trade deal. This is only going to happen, the regulatory alignment, if all else fails and we have to somehow keep the Northern Irish border free and open. Yeah. But Tory Brexiteers are absolutely apoplectic tonight over this. Except because people it could like, mean it, still taking the EU's rules. Yeah, but them. except people like Peter Lilly say that our trade deal with the EU should be incredibly simple. Nowhere in the world have, has, have two nations or nations tried to have a trade to win they're already in one and therefore have the same, we are in regular alignment with them. So therefore just keep that trade deal should be simple. So that this flies yeah. in the face of, of, of that statement. Well, it, when it, should be, it should be very simple. The only problem is we are, of course, leaving this club of 28, uh, which but is the very reason. But if we want a trade reason. deal, we'd have to stick to, you know, health regulations on producing baby toys or whatever that's the it point. might be. And that's the point. You, the single market is a, uh, a club full of a myriad of different rules. You agree to play by all the rules, you get to stay in the club and you, and you get the free trade because of it. The difficulty is we're asking for all of that having left the club. Mm. And the problem is, everyone said it was going to be very easy to do this. You know, we, in the, in the EU referendum, it was like, this is going to be very, very simple. It's going to be very, very easy. We will have all the power, we were told, you know, mm -hmm. when it comes to the negotiations. You know, take back control to give it to Arlene Foster, not Arlene Phillips, as my mum thought it was. She was very excited. She thought Arlene Phillips was now in charge. I was like, if only Arlene Phillips was Taking in charge. Control, exactly, floor. exactly. And look, I think people are just, people are now just baffled about what is going on. This whole issue of Ireland is a very, very serious problem. It's a problem that I think is going to be very, very difficult to solve, but it just shows you how this was never, ever, ever going to be easy. And I think people are really, even people who voted to leave the EU, I think secretly are thinking, this is not what we thought it was going to be. So this one here, Johnson & Gove lead cabinet revolt against the Prime Minister over fears she is actually forcing a soft Brexit. Yeah, this is, uh, in, in the Daily Telegraph's own reporting, this is not actually uh, Boris Johnson and, and uh, Michael Gove, it's allies of saying... Okay. And they, of course, will be the, the people who say to the, the Prime Minister, this is, alarms us the most because aligning ourselves to the EU potentially means we're not making our rules, we're, we're, we're taking rules. We can actually go one better than Daily Telegraph mm. tomorrow, that I'm sure okay. I wouldn't surprise you, Anna, yes. uh, to report that Boris Johnson actually brought this issue up with Theresa May in Cabinet today. Uh, and asked her to explain what she meant by regulatory alignment and express his concerns that this would mean shackling ourselves to the EU yeah. forevermore in his language. So, although this is technical and tedious and, and quite hard to, even right. for the likes of me, to have to understand <laughs> it and I have to read this stuff all day long, actually has real significance and consequence, which is potentially threatening Theresa May's tenure in number 10. She loses Gove, Boris and all the Brexiteers, her feet won't touch the ground. OK. I mean, we've been trying to get experts on all day to explain regulatory alignment with no success, I have to say. Sounds like something my osteopath would do to me. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. We all need that. Let's sit up straight for yes, this exactly. bit. Uh, both the prices and the noise levels on trains are rising. We'll be back with that in just a moment. <laughs> Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me this evening, Aisha Hazarika and Tom Newton Dunn. Uh, new papers in. Daily Star, bit of I'm a celebrity, as you can see. Uh, the Daily Mail, plastic, the tide turns, um, showing that uh, the UN boss is holding up a mail front page at the latest conference on the horror of plastics in our oceans. And the eye, rail anger, commuters hit by the biggest price hike for five years. Should we talk about that one quickly? 3.4%, what do you think? 
Well, I think people are absolutely livid about it. I mean, again, we go back to those burning, you know, injustices that Theresa May talked about, the just about managings. Train fares and rail fares are one of the biggest issues in terms of the cost of living crisis for people um, all over the country, particularly <coughs> in um, the South East. So I think people are absolutely incandescent Even though money's, by this. you know, ploughed back into rolling stock and so on. And but that's updating. not what you feel as a passenger. You are stuck at stations with you know, delayed trains. You cannot get a seat on the train. It's a complete living nightmare. And it doesn't seem to get better. Every year it seems to get worse and worse. And this is quite I've a significant... lines, you know, particularly that problem has been seen. But there's Southern, been, been decades yeah. of underinvestment in the stock and you know, track. So, uh, and now we are having to finally pay for it. So uh, I think uh, rail users do, should feel pretty hard to buy. And half of that is decades worth of underinvestment of the Labour government and the Conservative government. Uh, but there's also the, the fact that they've had to pick on uh, a certain number of RPI, I think it was last September or was it last August they, they choose, which is you know, the monthly inflation figures, which just so happens to be nine or three percent at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and that was always going to hurt everybody. I think it should be an average of the year and not one but month. Do you know something? Going back to the election, the, the, the sort of slightly, some people think controversial thing about Jeremy's Corbyn's thing about nationalising the trains are so popular when you speak to people because people are absolutely cheesed off mm. by you know just the failing rail system. Um, the Sun is in uh, now too charged by the Met plot to bomb number 10 and kill the Prime Minister. Cops claim they foiled a terror threat as you say full coverage of that in the court case tomorrow and up the top there Christine Keeler the cool girl who rocked Britain. Um, very significant figure of her time. Mm. Huge uh, iconic figure of the early 1960s mm. um, who really created an extraordinary storm, uh, many argue, began the eventual descent and downfall of the Macmillan government mm -hmm. with the, the 1960s scandal, having an affair with John Profumo, the Secretary State for War, as they were uh, slightly more excitedly known at the time, at the same time having an affair with a, a KGB agent, the Russian naval attaché at the Russian Embassy in London, uh, and it would appear half of um, aristocratic London at the same time. It was way, an she, immense scandal. She says, her family says she, she didn't have those affairs at the same time. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you read words from yeah. her book, she said she very, didn't. Very similar there to today. A he was a very powerful man. Them. Yeah, but not, not at the same time as it was yeah. kind of alleged. And apparently, you know, her, her affair with Prima was look, a though, short... All, all of the same, sure, but I'll tell you what was not a great look. She was a teenager yeah. mm. and she was exploited and yeah. manipulated That's by very powerful men. Yeah. And she was basically a very, very young woman. Real abuse of power there. Well, arguably she was pimped out. Yeah, uh, I agree and, with that. I uh, yeah. had no idea. Well, she, well, yeah. Incredibly, you know, she was only 75 now. All this happened yeah. more than 70 years ago. She was in, you know, 2021 when all this was going on. Since then, she's lived her life as an extraordinary recluse. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Her family put out statements today saying, uh, you know, mm -hmm. what an immense personal toll it, it took yeah. on her entire life. And it, it is a tragic life, really. You, you make what was some pretty terrible mistakes at the time. Uh, under the influence of a lot of powerful men and your entire life is, um, is really spent um, having to hide from it. Anymore. Absolutely and I think for a lot of these particularly young women who are caught up in a sex scandal particularly with the tabloids with men of power you know they are exploded into the limelight at a young age but as you say it takes a very very heavy psychological toll on them and they pay it for it for the rest of their lives. We'll see you at half past 11 with more. Thank you very much indeed Aisha and Tom. Top stories coming up for you next, back in just a moment.